Welcome to Faith 2020's Roundtable with Tom Steyer. Uh, my name is Reverend Adam Phillips. Uh, you are joining a Faith 2020 conversation that we've been having during this entire year of um, organizing and mobilizing and social distancing. Uh, and so we're really grateful that we can uh, join you all here online today for this really important conversation on the intersection of faith, climate, and our work to be anti-racist. Um, we often don't talk about these things in intersectional ways. And I think for us as people of faith that are reflecting and meditating on these values, and also people that are really concerned about the direction of our country, it's, it's critical that we think about these in intersectional ways. And so I couldn't be more uh, grateful that Tom Steyer is with us today, who's been at the forefront of this conversation. Also joined by uh, a really great panel of faith leaders, uh, Rev Yearwood from Hip Hop Caucus, Brian McLaren, who uh, to so many of us is sort of like a bishop in uh, the progressive evangelical world, and uh, my friend Bishop Yvette Flunder from the Fellowship of Affirming Ministries. Bishop, would you open us with a word of prayer? Shall we pray? Gracious God, divine one by all of your many names in all of your beautiful and magnificent manifestations, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to share heart to heart, concern to concern, hope to hope in this time of sharing and giving our own perspectives from our own areas of experience. We ask that you would be with us. We ask that you will give us wisdom and knowledge, crown our heads with understanding, passion and compassion. And because we believe and we refuse to despair, we become people of hope, people of promise, people of purpose. We ask these favors today in your many names and all of your incredible and beautiful manifestations, and we call them into existence. Amen and praise God. Amen. 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 Thank you, Bishop. Tom Steyer left his successful investing business to give his own money, time, and energy to fighting for progressive causes. He soon became one of the country's leading forces in registering more young voters and voters of color, fighting climate change, working for racial justice, and helping secure better lives for all Americans. From, from founding voter mobilization organization Next Gen America to spearheading impeachment with need to impeach, Tom has led a number of people first grassroots campaigns that have repeatedly defeated powerful special interests. Tom has mobilized grassroots efforts to be, beat big oil, to win clean air laws, force big tobacco to pay its share of healthcare costs, and close a billion dollar corporate tax loophole to fund public schools. Most recently, as many of you may know, Tom was a former Democratic presidential candidate and now serves as co-chair for Governor Newsom's Business and Jobs Recovery Task Force in California. He also co-chairs Vice President Biden's Climate Engagement Advisory Council to help mobilize climate voters in November. And Tom's story of fighting uh, for climate action is rooted in his uh, deep faith. So I'm really grateful that Tom Steyer can join us. Tom, thanks for being part of this Faith 2020 Roundtable. Adam, thank you so much for that introduction. And Bishop Flunder, thank you so much for those words to start us off in a positive and loving way. I really appreciate it. I will say that 2020 would test anyone's faith. <laughs> I mean, we have a series of overlapping interconnected crises, any one of which normally would be the sole and most important topic of conversation and political and the political election. We've got the pandemic, we've got the sharp economic contraction and high unemployment resulting from the pandemic. We are confronting systemic racism in our society. We have got a climate crisis that people are living real time in the United States, and we have our democracy under attack, both at home and abroad. Normally, any one of those would dominate the news, but the news is happening so fast. The events are happening with such rapidity that it's hard to remember what happened last week. I mean, today is Wednesday. Eight days ago, we had a presidential debate that was cataclysmic, but now seems as if it was three months ago. We had the president's taxes revealed 10 days ago that showed that he was paying $750 of income tax on revenues of $75 million. 
So it's hard to rem- it's hard to keep in mind what's happened. It's hard to remember that within the week, the president has tested positive for the coronavirus, that he has hid it from the American people, that he's had to be hospitalized, that he's acted recklessly and endangered both the people that he works with and his supporters, putting his own political interests ahead of the lives and safety of American people. Look, I'm not trying to depress you. This doesn't depress me. The point I'm trying to make is the stakes have never been higher. The outcome has never been more important. And the chasm between the candidates has never been bigger. And I am very happy to say, I believe that the moment has found the man. That in fact, in Joe Biden, we have a candidate who is the opposite of Donald Trump. We have a candidate who leads with compassion, who leads with heartfelt empathy for other people and really sees his policies through their impact on people. Somebody who is as a vision of pulling us together. I mean, he just gave a speech in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania that echoed Lincoln's second inaugural with malice towards none, with charity for all. That is the exact opposite of what we have in the White House right now. And I wanna talk for a second about climate because Joe Biden's climate plan is very much a human-centered plan. It's aggressive in the sense that it spends $2 trillion in the first four years, talks about 100% clean electricity generation by 2035 and carbon neutrality economy-wide by 2050. It's aggressive, but it's very much a human-centered plan because that's how Joe Biden understands things. That's how he relates to ideas. So it would create millions and millions of good paying, middle-class organized labor jobs across America at a time of high unemployment. I have never heard Joe Biden talk about climate without talking about the dignity and the rights of working people and working families. And Adam was talking about intersectionality. This is a plan which has environmental justice at its heart. You know, it is impossible to look at climate, environmentalism, clean energy in the United States without knowing that this society has concentrated its poisons, its air pollution, its water pollution, its toxicity in underserved black and brown communities. Yes. And if you're gonna get an answer to climate that is just, that starts from a place of equity and justice, you have to start with those communities, with leadership from those communities, and with an awareness that any plan has got to redress that systemic racially based injustice as a central core part of what it's doing. And the Biden plan does do that. So when Adam was talking about intersectionality, about racial justice, about climate, about job opportunities widespread that you can afford to have a family on, that's what the Biden plan addresses. And let me say this, that plan is emblematic of who he is and what he cares about. And we're gonna win. I mean, Adam said, I started Next Gen America, which is the biggest youth voter mobilizer in American history. Young people are the biggest group in America. 40% of potential voters are between 18 and 35. They voted half the rate of other American citizens. They're the most progressive generation in America. They're the most diverse generation by far in American history. And I believe they will come out in historic levels this year. And I, there's a lot of data to back it up and they will change everything. We will have a turnout based election that changes everything. And just as with climate, we can see a coalition coming together behind Joe Biden that includes underserved communities, black and brown communities, indigenous communities. We can see organized labor. We can see young people responding. Just so you know, I'll give you one public statistic. Hillary Clinton won Arizona for young people by 18%. 
Joe Biden is winning Arizona by 42% with young people. I'm just gonna give you that one number because that is emblematic and consistent with what we're seeing around the country. So we're seeing a Biden candidacy that addresses the need for economic growth, for job creation, good middle-class family sustaining job creation. It also has racial justice at its center and that appeals broadly to America. And let me say this, I completely agree and echo what Bishop Flunder was saying. Faith is a form of optimism. Faith is belief in something. Faith is belief in the goodness of the universe at its core, that in the goodness of our fellow Americans, that the good will always win. That is what I firmly believe. And that belief in the core goodness at the heart of the universe, as Bishop Flunder said, people call by a lot of names, but that is something that involves protecting the most vulnerable amongst us, preserving God's earth for the future, actually having a belief that working together and preserving each other and building a society for each other is at the heart of a meaningful life. And that's why it's a great pleasure for me to be with people of faith this morning. It is always incredibly relaxing to be with people who share that optimism about the future that is rooted in a belief that that core principle that many people, including me, call God is the animating force in the universe and will always pull us together in the end, that we will always win. So with that, I'd like to turn it back over to Adam. Thanks, Tom. Really, really grateful for that word. Um, you know, so much of this conversation when it comes to faith and politics has been hijacked by, I don't think it's in the Bible, but Patty Smith said it, uh, wrestle the world back from fools. <laughs> People have the power here, right? Um, and really, you know, Democrats are overwhelmingly people of faith uh, and kind of that big tent, multi-faith, pluralistic vision of what makes America truly uh, an incredible place. I love what you said about um, Arizona and young people. And especially when we look at the data of voters, especially uh, Latinx Catholic voters in Maricopa County, these are folks that may be pro-life in some ways, but they are pro-immigrant and they are pro-climate. They are pro-Pope Francis. Um, and so there's a really uh, tremendous opportunity to flip the script here, I think. And I'm really looking forward to not just a, a great election, but uh, better days ahead in 2021. So I really thank you for that word, um, especially resonate with the, this idea as a, as a pastor myself that, that we are to return to our original goodness and to, re to help repair uh, creation even uh, and partner with neighbors near and far. Um, I was wondering if uh, Reverend Yearwood wanted to ask a question here or comment on, on Tom's, uh, Tom's uh, remarks. Well, I just appreciate uh, Tom's comments because, well, I appreciate Tom. Uh, I've known Tom for quite some time now. And, and actually when we hang out, we actually talk more about faith and about people than we do about policy. Um, and, and that's just a good thing. I want to mention that because I think there's a misconception that progressives are not people of faith. And that's very wrong. Um, it's actually, I've seen some of the most, um, most the deepest faith you can imagine in conversations with young people and older people and the progressive movement and using faith um, to, to, to kind of keep going. So really, I guess, I just wanted to just echo what, what, what Tom said. I think that the one thing that he mentioned that's so important is in regards to the climate crisis. And in that, you know, the one thing that he referenced into Biden's plan is, is this, the people, if we don't get this correct, are going to die. And we need someone in charge who can bring it all together. And so the plan that he was referencing was talking not just about the technical aspect of the plan from the wind and the solar and what we're doing on that front, but also the social, the economic, the political and the spiritual aspects of the, with the climate crisis. And I just hope that the churches who are watching this, members of faith, 
who are who are wondering where their role is right now. Um, I just want to tell you that when you say nonprofit, that doesn't mean not to be a nonprofit. <laughs> uh, P R O P H E T. Um, I think that I think that we have to still proclaim the good news. Um, and so I just want to say that, Tom, I think that, you know, thank you uh, for your words. And I guess for me, it's just really how do we continue to connect the dots? You mentioned about breaking the silos, in essence, about climate justice and racial justice and immigration justice. I guess how do we how do we bring it together from our spiritual core? moving forward. Mm. Do you want me to address that, Rev? Yeah, I guess that's my I guess that's my question back to you. Well, look, I don't believe as a society that we're going to handle the political challenges in front of us without a spiritual rebirth as a society. Mm. I think at our core what we're searching for and what we need is that the acceptance again of a value-driven spiritual essence of what we're trying to accomplish with life on earth. And if we, if we accept that, then we are going to in fact be the country that we want to be, claim to be, aspire to be. And if we in fact get that spiritual court, will we address racial injustice? systemic racial justice we have to will will we preserve god's earth yes i mean you're talking about people dying we're talking about unimaginable suffering if we don't act on that will we deal with the economic inequality in our society look if we can accept that spiritual rebirth yes of course we will and will we argue about how to do it for sure that is democracy. That is fine. But the question that we have to ask ourselves is, are we going to get back to being a purpose-driven, value-driven, spiritually deep country? Mm. That if we don't, I honestly believe we won't accomplish our goals. And if we do, then I believe we will accomplish more than we can even imagine. And that will be our proudest achievement. But it's mm. that mm. spiritual rebirth, Rev, that I think is at the heart of this. And we have to talk in those terms because I think we've got to go deeper than the politics because that superficial political way of thinking is what got us into this problem in the first place, in my opinion. Amen. I think we need to get Tom on a, a, a lay preaching tour through Zoom in January and February in the, in the country's churches. Uh, this, this is great. Um, Brian, I'm wondering if you wanted to jump in here with any thoughts or, or a question. Well, I'll tell you the thing I want to say most strongly is just a big amen to Tom and, and a big thanks, Tom, because you have been such a strong leader uh, and you've been so smart to first emphasize young people and young voters, because this is the sad thing. I think we're seeing an older generation, you know, my age, older, who who just are doubling down on wanting to keep things the way they like it and the way they're used to. And they, they and, and the younger generation knows if we keep going with that, we're destroying their future. So you've been so smart to focus on that and then so smart to focus on climate because every single issue that we care about, uh, race, uh, economic equality, uh, every, every issue we care about just falls to pieces if we don't deal with the climate. Uh, it, it really isn't a separate issue. It is. It underlies every single issue. And I also think you're right to emphasize the spiritual dimension to this because when people love money more than anything else, then you get the world we've got. And you have shown, your, your own biography is just this great story of someone who had a knack for making money, but, but you loved other things more than money. And this is, and, and maybe the only thing I'll say and invite a comment, is this is where I'll speak as a, pa I was a pastor for 24 years. Um, this is where a lot of our religious leaders have sold out. A lot of people don't realize that there's been a kind of citizens united in religion where the biggest donors had the biggest influence in religious world. And um, this is where uh, we, we have to say, our religious leaders are going to have to say, we care about things more than money too. So. Wow. Mm. Brian, that is a heavy statement about 
a Citizens United for Religion. Yeah. Mm. yeah. I will say this. I've had I have been very lucky and I have I did start a business and I had en enormous advantages from hundreds of years or maybe thousands of years of people sacrificing mostly nameless anonymous poor people living their lives out to build something that I was a that I was born into and got the advantage of and I never I have always despised people who, who never, who don't remember that, who don't realize that the society that those anonymous, mostly very poor people yeah. built mm -hmm. often with their lives was yeah. not something that just sprang out of whole cloth, but was the work and the determined effort of spiritually driven people who got, who really sacrificed for all of us. And so I am highly aware of how lucky I am. And I believe that anybody who gets those advantages, including me, has an absolute obligation to try and return some part of the favor that was done by those often very young, very poor young men and women who sacrificed to build this society in this country. And so the idea that that money was mine never, mm -hmm. ever occurred to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's that's right. It's this idea of stewardship and stewardship of our gifts and talents and time and treasure and and creation, right? Um, Bishop Flunder, you're in Oakland, California, uh, in Tom's neighborhood, so to speak. And curious how you've seen. You know, we've been working together on an inclusion and equity work for a number of years, and I've really been grateful for your leadership. I'm wondering how you see the adverse effect of climate change in Oakland and in the people that you minister to and with? Well, first, let me say that um, I am appreciating in so many ways Tom's contribution, uh, not just in what it is that he has contributed to and really put his, his uh, ability to make change fiscally and uh, with hope and prayer and faith but the fact that he is prioritizing what really is our stewardship, essentially uh, the earth. Uh, I think that what is problematic in communities like the communities where I serve is a, a eschatology, an, a, an understanding of uh, the things to come, uh, the end of the world eschatology that hinders people from understanding our primary responsibility Jesus said, when you pray, pray your kingdom, your realm come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And I'm surrounded by a number of people who have been influenced by uh, religion that teaches us that what we need to do is get ready to go to heaven over against getting ready to make heaven come to earth. Essentially, that is our obligation. That is our stewardship. And I might also say to do that kind of work uh, that abuses the, the planet in the name of Jesus is an oxymoron because uh, you have to understand that this brown Palestinian Jew who, who uh, is, informs much of what I believe was also in trouble all the time with religion and empire, <laughs> much the same as all of us are. Um, and consequently, got killed for it. Let's just be clear about that. You know, if we remove all the religiosity, understand it was a, a getting together of folks that did not like his messaging, that made sure that, or thought that they made sure that they brought an end to it. So I want to say to you that there's something very godly, something very holy, something very right about assuming again our care for our first assignment as human beings which is to care for our mother. The earth is our mother, all of our mother, and we are responsible to do that. And then I would also like to add that uh, in the middle of this kind of shifting and changing that we are experiencing here in Oakland, what we are finding out in Oakland and San Francisco Bay Area um, is an overwhelming presence of housing insecurity. Mm -hmm. And housing insecurity 
can be addressed in so many ways if we are willing to do the work that we need to do so that the people who are uh, put in places where they cannot afford housing, that we level the playing field by having folks like you, Tom, and others who have the wherewithal to sit down at table with the people who are out here uh, experiencing this loss, to find out where and how and in what ways we can definitively address what causes people to be housing insecure and food insecure and um, job insecure and not leave people to uh, being relegated to being mentally ill or emotionally ill or drug addicted or there's so much that I could say about a mother who lives in a tent who has two five gallon paint cans, one of which is a sink to wash dishes and to bathe her kids, the other is a toilet. But she sends her children to school from that situation, primarily because, not because of any of the things that are stereotypes, but because of the uneven realities of wealth and the inability for those that are at a certain level to understand the importance of making sure we level the playing field. Why am I saying this? I'm saying this because right now, federal funds have been taken away from institutions, schools included, that are teaching about equality and teaching about the importance of, of equity. Now this nation has decided from the president down that those lessons can no longer be taught in institutions and businesses because it makes America look bad. This woman living in this tent makes America look bad. That's my hope that we can get together on these issues and make change happen. Thank you so much. It's a good word, Bishop. Um, I'm gonna bring in uh, Stephen Harris, who is a friend of mine who uh, used to be Oh, well, he's an American religion history scholar and also works at the intersection of public policy and faith. He was at the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission of the Southern Baptist Convention, and he's supporting Joe Biden for president this year. So really excited that Stephen can join us. He's also working on a PhD with Dr. Cornell West at Harvard, and uh, he's got a question for the panel here. Let's see if he comes on. Here he comes. Welcome, Stephen. Hey, hello, hello. Good to have you. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, yeah do you have a question? Yeah, no, I, I think this is great. I'm, I'm looking at everybody and I'm hearing all the conversation. I think everybody on here is Rev, uh, Rev Steyer, especially uh, <laughs> with, with the, the commentary that has been uh, going forth. Just really appreciate it. I mean, I, I cannot be overstated the importance of this faith perspective that we bring to this conversation. Um, as a historian of religion, I, I can't help but often think about the ways in which the inequities and the injustice that Bishop Flunder was just kind of chronicling for us, these things in many ways begin with certain theological imaginations that sanction and legitimize a kind of hierarchical arrangement of people, of bodies. Um, not unrelated to land, not unrelated to environment. And when people's conceptions of how they steward land, how they're gonna use land, contains in it a particular notion of economic accrual and benefit to myself, then I'm going to exploit other people. And in the American context, we see this explicitly in the 17th and 18th century. Uh, uh, Native peoples, African peoples relegated to what? Reservations, slave quarters, right? spaces that open them up to uh, particular hazards. Uh, and we see that kind of roll on in kind of our kind of understanding of history. And so it cannot be understated um, the importance of the spiritual dynamic of all of this. And, uh, and as one who is thinking out of a distinctly mm -hmm. Christian tradition, that kind of crucicentric tendency to put the interests of others above myself. I think uh, Tom, Tom, you referenced it explicitly. If we don't have that kind of conception of a worldview undergirding all of this, that, that it's not just about me, it's about serving others. It's about our collective project of 
thinking about how we're going to societally organize ourselves for a sustainable future. Um, if I can't, if I'm not working with any of those kind of concepts, uh, then I'm really starting from a, a, a short-sighted place. And so I, I just want to, again, just commend the, the words that have already been spoken. Uh, and, and I'm happy to contribute to this discussion because it, it, the perspective that we bring is so vital um, and, and it's so historical. And if we want to have, a, have a, a right reckoning with these things, then we have to understand what happened. The last thing I'll say as a historian, I'm often having conversations about people, about different historical imaginaries about what happened. We got to get the history right. Uh, uh, what, yes. what have we been bequeathed? What have we been bequeathed? How are we going to reckon with it? Um, those are a lot of the conversations that I'm finding myself ha having in this moment uh, for the sake of bringing people along on this journey. Tom. Adam, I, 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 I want to respond to Stephen. Yeah. I also want to respond to Bishop Flunder. Um, Please. Stephen, the need to deal with our history honestly and retell the story of America is why when I was running for president every single day I called for reparations for the descendants of enslaved people. Because I felt until we tell that truth to each other and decide how to repair the damage that was done, that it continues to be done, there's no way for us to move on together. Black people or white people, Latinos, Un, that is a project that has to be undertaken together and accomplished together so that we can move on together. That has always been true in American history. And that's why I spoke up for reparations to all white audiences who had no idea what the heck I was talking about, that it was important for that to happen. And, and Bishop Flunder, I want to say this. There are two projects that my partner, Kat Taylor, and I have undertaken over the last 15 years. I'm not sure you're aware of them. One of them is a nonprofit bank in, based in Oakland, California, called Beneficial State Bank. We measure every single loan in terms of its impact on economic justice and environmental sustainability, as well as to make sure that it's a self-sustaining bank. It specifically supports businesses owned by women and people of color. But every single loan gets measured for its impact on the community. No loan can have negative impact and they have to have, you have to be able to show in terms of job creation, carbon uh, emissions averted, ownership by people who wouldn't otherwise get to own and operate businesses, that in fact it's working. And we started, of course, with zero. We got our license probably 14 years ago, and it's over a billion dollars. So it's something specifically designed to address some of the economic injustice in our society in a way that we thought would be the most impactful. And the other thing I wanted, and I want to address this issue about housing insecurity and food insecurity, because that is homelessness and hunger. That's what those words, it's human beings who are hungry, including a lot of kids and people who are living outside without a shelter over them, a, a, a full-time shelter. And one of the things that Kat Taylor and I started with something called California Food for California Kids, which is farm to table in the public schools, a third of the public schools in California that serve a billion meals a year so that kids don't just get food, kids who are on free and reduced lunch, but they get healthy food that they can live on and be healthy on. And the, 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 what we're seeing in California, we are seeing unbelievable lack of how affordable housing we are also seeing an incredible spike in hunger. 10% mm -hmm. of California uses food banks. Mm -hmm. And so we're seeing the level, and it's absolutely critical that that food be food that actually kids can grow up on, that can be healthy on, not Coke and chips. Yeah. And so let me just say that if I, people ask me about God, sometimes they say, you know, do you believe in God? And I say, let me tell you what the closest is I've ever been to God. The closest I've ever been to God. I'm just take a drink of water. It is watching an eight-year-old boy with really big ears down in Southern California eat a fish taco that was fresh with a big smile in the sun. That to me was like, wow. 
that will be as close as I can ever get to that idea of a spiritual growth, seeing something distinctly good, purely good, and the pleasure on that little boy's face. And so when you talk about homelessness and hunger, it's in, in our state, it is extremely endemic. It's really deep. And for somebody who actually is working for anybody who, who really cares about the most vulnerable amongst us, you know, people say that's the measure of a society. How do they treat the most vulnerable amongst them? And so for us, we have a long way to go to address those issues and to be, you know, to really join in a communion of human beings and human spirit. Reminds me of that um, teaching from Irenaeus, who was a early church father, a teacher in the earliest church. And, and Irenaeus said that the glory of God is humanity fully alive. And that's seen in the faces of children. Um, the pandemic, uh, Tom, I want to ask you a little bit about COVID and, and impact on climate. The, you know, when <laughs> I'm in Portland, so the day that the climate fire started to really, really get bad um, here, all up and down the, the, the West Coast, you tweeted out a picture of yourself outside and the skies were orange. And I, and I showed my wife, I said, oh my gosh, look at this. And then within a couple hours, it was like that up here in Portland. And my wife works in education and she's trying to do equity and inclusion work for um, the least served communities in Multnomah County. Um, in your work with Governor Newsom or uh, with Vice President Biden, how are you seeing the adverse effect of COVID on climate work as well? I'm, I'm wondering if you could speak to that. The adverse effect of COVID on climate. Look, yeah. when I think about this pandemic and I think about climate and the intersection, they're very parallel to me. Mm. You know, this is a nat the natural world acting independently of human politics. And it is a, a reflection of who we are and how we treat it and how we protect each other. And so I think there was a sense that somehow the sharp economic slowdown, the fact that people aren't traveling, the, the fact that people aren't flying would mean that there would be less greenhouse gas emissions and that in some way, right. this would be um, an unintended relief for those of us who are worried about parts per million CO2. That in fact, the slowdown in emissions would mean that it somehow helped us. And that just for anybody who's hoping that that's true, that is not true. You know, there has been a slowdown in terms of travel. There has been a slowdown in terms of driving. But actually, if you look at the parts per million in the change year over year, we continue to move, for, you know, to raise the parts per million at at least the same rate that we were before. So when I think about this, both of these are pushback from the natural world that, uh, that human beings can only respond to by protecting each other. That in fact, unless you can't protect yourself, you can really only protect each other. Wearing a mask is about protecting other people from you. And they're wearing a mask is protecting you from anything that they'd have. And so when we look at these challenges, we have a gigantic challenge in front of us that we can only successfully combat by giving up that sense of egotism and self-obsession and really living for each other. And it's, I mean, it's ironic that the only way that you can actually succeed personally is by succeeding together and by giving yourself up to the good of other people. But I will say this too. I, I believe that we will all be happier and more joyous and have more meaningful lives if we do that. And so I don't believe that it's a sacrifice at all. I, I truly believe that that is the thing, you know, it's like the prayer of St. Francis, that is the thing that will give us happiness, joy, and meaning in our lives is the recognition that we're actually trying to create something together and we need to protect each other. And I see COVID that way. And I certainly see climate that way. And I know, and that's why I said at the heart of it, is a spiritual rebirth about what we're trying to accomplish together and, and an acceptance of a deeper power for good in this world that we accept and try and tie ourselves to and align ourselves with. Ryan, do you want to uh, comment on, on that? 
Uh, well, f first, th that idea of spiritual rebirth, it's, it's as if all the tactics that have got us to this point, for better and for worse, aren't working anymore. And we really need a new start. We need uh, fresh thinking. Uh, one of our terrible problems in politics is that uh, at least one of our political parties hasn't really had a new idea since 1980. And they just keep repeating the same things that, that are, are taking us farther and farther down. But because... In politics, as in religion, people are often loyal to what they've heard rather than uh, excited about fresh thinking. Um, they just hear the same old, same old government is the problem, all that kind of a thing. And they stop thinking and they subcontract out their mind to, to people who have died. <laughs> and, and that's why paying attention to the younger generation means that we need a new kind of spirituality. And, and I, as Tom is speaking, I just keep thinking, you know, the, the mask reminds us that we share air and, and what comes out of our mouth and our lungs, somebody else breathes in. We are inextricably connected to each other. We're inextricably connected to the environment. Uh, boundaries of, nobody can build a wall that keeps air on one side and not on the other. Uh, and uh, so all races, all religions, we've got to figure out how to embrace this new uh, this new humanity. And it calls for theological change as well as political change. Um, uh, Bishop Yvette mentioned earlier about eschatology, our view of the future. And then um, Stephen Harris talked about history, our view of the past. And, and we're at this place, we need a whole new way of seeing, seeing our past in a different way, seeing our future in a different way. And uh, boy, that is a deep, deep change. And voting doesn't do all of it, but voting really, really is important. And uh, I'm, yes. uh, you know, you think of the, the people who are getting all of the attention in the media for the stupid and harmful things they're doing. And then you think about the people on, uh, that we're in this conversation with uh, who have vital creative new ideas. And that is cause for hope. I want to get to voting in a, in a moment. But I, I was wondering, Stephen, if you could respond to this idea of the, 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 the theological conversation, the imagination, and, and how in, in your work with the Southern Baptist Convention, for instance, how, how have you found um, messaging around climate change or maybe what we might call creation care effective or, or how can we get smarter in that space to, to bring along people that may not agree with us on all things po politics, but agree that we need to care for uh, the earth in, in better ways? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think there are a number of theological resources that that we have at hand um, goes fundamentally to how we view each other as all being made in the image of God, right? So the Imago Dei uh, has in it inherent notions of dignity, of human flourishing that ought be accorded to, in this context, all American citizens without prejudice, right? So we need to think about the ways in which our own activities and even the policies that we give ourselves to either affirm or denigrate the image of God in all people, right? How can I, how can I, um, how can my efforts advance human flourishing and human dignity? Um, and then it, it does it does contain a kind of critique of, as, as Brian mentioned, the ways in which perhaps we have previously thought about things, right? And the kinds of ideologies we've given ourselves over to and the ways in which when you talk about religion and theology, the, the temptation is always nigh to, to, to distort and do violence to those kinds of uh, imaginations in ways that again, accrue interest and benefit to ourselves, right? This has always been uh, the fundamental temptation, right? And, and what does that look like on a national scale, right? Going back to American, American history. But, but I think that fundamental conception of um, inestimable value uh, accorded to all uh, individuals and then thinking about the ways in which I see that value um, undermined um, and not uh, commended and not affirmed in policies and in and, and very real and concrete ways that I all give myself to the work of trying to rectify that. Um, so just that's just one example of a fundamental theological concept that we can look to. I want to say one more thing and then I'll, I'll, I want to hear from, from everyone else, but this thing that Tom mentioned about this communal collective project, right? I having a conversation the other day, I kind of was raising uh, a kind of a critique of a kind of neoliberal imagination that kind of views us, our fundamental uh, images, you know, we're kind of 
entrepreneurs in competition with, with each other. We are fundamentally meant to pursue our own self-interest and we let kind of fundamental market logics uh, kind of define how we relate societally. That leads to a particular kind of uh, polis, a particular kind of people. And I don't think that that is compatible with the kind of vision that Tom laid out, right? Uh, so not, not, not to, to disrupt or, or frustrate anybody's kind of economic uh, uh, rationalities, but I think we need to think critically about the ways in which we perhaps have given ourselves over to particular ways of thinking about societally engaging that are fundamentally rooted in a kind of self-interest, self-interestedness and not fundamentally rooted in a kind of communal idea about how we can pursue the interests of others above ourselves. Um, that's a part of this too. And I think, again, that's deeply and inherently theological in its orientation. May I add one thing that comes up for me? Is this a good time, Adam? I think he's, he's frozen, Bishop, so I would say go right ahead. Yeah, yeah I would too. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the, the thing that, that, that has been uh, uh, blessing me and my thinking over the last several days, particularly working with uh, young adults and uh, younger people, sometimes first time voters, uh, but others that are in and around faith. Um, I am a Biden supporter. And one of the reasons why I am a Biden supporter is uh, first of all, because um, I believe in voting hope instead of voting fear. I am, I believe, and I trust, and I hope. Um, uh, otherwise, as a African-American, same gender loving woman, faith leader, trust me, <laughs> I would have given up a long time ago <laughs> in church, not just out of church, in and around church people. But I choose hope. And I believe that we together can create a much greater and better world. And I'm not Pollyanna-ish about that. I am very clear that it's going to take some real work to get where it is that we need to be. But I see among young people, many young people, they seem to have hope voting, confidence voting, uh, hope for the future voting. Now there are some who have been in many ways scarred by what they have experienced among those who are older than them, who have had responsibility to help to design a world and pass a baton to them. However, there's an enormous amount of hope. And that confidence brought up for me, and, and let me just say this, I have been in three good generations of civil rights movements. Um, I just turned 65 on my last birthday. And I've seen a lot of marches and I've seen a lot of victories and I've seen some setbacks, but I've also seen the arc of justice move forward in various and sundry ways. But I have never seen in my lifetime the kind of responses from young adults in the street for weeks on end saying things like Black Lives Matter while the groups of people who are marching are as much not Black young people as they are Black young people and young people of color. This is new for me and new for us. And I must say that it gives me hope. I believe that, that love beats hatred every day. I believe that faith kicks despair's butt something fearsome, okay? <laughs> I believe, I believe, and I choose to believe that we can overcome, not just that we want to, but that we can, I believe that. And that is what informs my faith. It informs the way I treat the planet. It informs the way I treat folks, but it informs also a vote of hope. It is a vote of intention but it is also a vote of hope, not a vote of fear. And let me say, now that my brother Adam is back, let me just say that I know this atmosphere is designed to terrify people like me. Mm -hmm. Everything I am 
has been debated by a Supreme Court at some time in mm -hmm. my, either in my life or before my life. My color, my gender, my marriage, my orientation, my faith, everything that I am has been debated about whether or not I can exist. <laughs> but mm -hmm. I am apparently part of the impossibles who do <laughs> exist in this time. And if I can have hope, and if these young people can have hope, if my brother Tom and my brother Brian and Rev can have hope and Stephen can have hope and Adam can have hope, then our world, in my thinking, can have hope. Thank you for your conversation about reparations. Thank you, because I would love to see school loans paid for and incarceration records expunged and access to medical insurance. And I could go on and on and on about things that are disproportionately real in the African-American community. But I will say to you that my hope says that we have an opportunity to vote hope and to bring an air of hope back into our world. The whole world is waiting for the United States to mm -hmm. right itself. And I don't mean as in mm -hmm. the leftists and the rightists, but I mean to correct the incorrect trajectory that we are on now. God bless you and thank you for giving me an opportunity. Mahalo. <laughs> So glad that you could jump in. I've never had that happen to me in all of these conversations. Uh, uh, so thank you um, for being patient and thank you for that word of hope and exhortation. Um, we've got time for maybe one more question and Tom, I, you know, we're, we're gonna get out the vote. Faith 2020 is about choosing hope over fear. And if we prevail, we still have tons of work to do. So what do you see is achievable in 2021 if we elect Biden uh, to the presidency? Well, Adam, I think it's fair to say that electing the Biden-Harris ticket is step one. It, we absolutely have to do that. Um, Bishop Flunder is absolutely right that we absolutely have to show up as an expression of faith in the future and in each other. That has to happen. But we aren't going to get what we need if that's all that happens, to be fair. We are going to have to vote the whole ticket. And I believe this is going to happen across this country. And that led by young people, we're going to flip the Senate of the United States. And that is absolutely critical. And I think that when we look at what we need to do in terms of a huge infrastructure project to put people back to work, to deal with, to build a clean energy economy, to deal with racial injustice, we cannot have a Senate that is presided over by Mitch McConnell. And if that's true, you know, I, I liken it to if we get Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, we'll stop the bleeding, but we, we will not be able to perform an operation that we need unless we get the Senate of the United States as well. And if that happens, I believe we can start to look at what we need, which is transformation. This can't be marginal change. The changes we're talking about are deeply rooted in values that are different. And the whole idea, in my mind, where it really goes back to a Reaganite philosophy about if you take care of the most, the richest amongst us, the most privileged amongst us, the most elite amongst us, somehow it will literally trickle down to everybody else. And we have 40 years to tell us that's not true, that it's never trickled down. And at the heart of that was selfishness, but there was also, it is impossible to discuss this without saying there was also systemic racism at the heart of that. And that that has always been part of this agenda. And so when we talk about the need for economic justice, we can never move away from racial justice. We can never forget it and we can never forget environmental justice. And so when I look at what we need, we need to come together about a different set of values that involves much more equity in our society, treating people fairly, being, oh, I mean, I, when Bishop Flunder was talking about homelessness and about a woman living on the street, that woman is exactly the same value 
as one of the people who's the richest in, in America. Exactly the same worth as a human being. And if you actually accept that idea, we're gonna have a very different society and we're gonna make different decisions and we need to make, that is the truth. That is everything that we stand for. And when we accept that, then we're gonna have transformation. And the ironic part of this whole thing is we will also have growth. We will grow as a people in many ways. And so for all the people who are worried about what this is gonna cost them, actually we're gonna go back to being a healthily growing society that shares with each other and we move up together, which is the concept of the United States of America. It's always been about equity, equality and freedom. And we, can have, we can't have any of them without having all of them. And that's what we need to transform right now. It's a good word, thank you, Tom. Rev, I'm wondering what Hip Hop Caucus is doing here uh, in the final stretch these last 27 days before the election. Could you share a little bit? Yeah, this, I guess I just wanna follow what Tom said. I uh, just wanted to say a couple of things that, I mean, well, you know, there are some parts of that, obviously I agree. And there's some parts of that, that I think that the idea of this country always being having some of those ideas may not always be the case. And I think that we have to deal with that reality as well, that this country has been based upon an institution of, of white supremacy. Um, and no question. Racism. Yeah, and I don't no think question. that Tom is disagreeing with that at what one bit. So I just wanted to highlight that, that this, the one that to this kind of end on that, on that note that that wasn't the case. And I think also for many of us, Hip Hop Caucus, you know, we have a we have a hundred day plan right now to get the vote out, and that literally goes beyond as you know can imagine the, the election. Um, you can join us with the respect my vote. We're both not only in the suites but the streets. Our, our, our group is really you know the folks who are not in college because while they may be while we have a lot of good folks in college, there are folks who are in the Crips and the Bloods and, and other gangs around the country, um, returning citizens that we have to reach as well. Um, and so that's where we are, Hip Hop Caucus. We're really trying to get those um, in those communities who sometimes don't see how policy impacts their lives. And that's where we are um, offsetting that. So, you know, that's, and we actually partner really well with Next Gen, one of the groups and many other groups um, from the Sunrise and others who are with, primarily with college students, but we work a lot with more of those kids who are non-college students. But I just wanted to say this, the, the first hundred days um, uh, we, we pray. I mentioned, I mentioned before we got in this call that Tom asked me if I was traveling a lot. I said, I'm praying a lot. And so um, I just want to say that um, in the first hundred days um, after, um, you know, prayerfully the inauguration of, of a new president, um, I will say this, that we're not going back. Um, we will have the fierce urgency of now, as Dr. King said, that we have to be there for climate justice and racial justice, because that can't be moved to the back burner, because we know that, again, we are not only fighting for equality, but existence. So Hip Hop Caucus is doing some great work in the streets. Uh, you can go there, respectmyvote.com, see what we're doing. Um, we're having some real conversation with people, and we would love anybody who wants to help that, um, that work that we're doing now in, in our states around the country. Thanks, Rev. Uh, I want to thank this whole panel. Um, thanks to Tom Steyer, Rev from Hip Hop Caucus, um, Bishop Flunder, Brian McLaren for joining us. My name is Adam Phillips with Faith 2020. We're set to launch major uh, digital ads at scale in Pennsylvania and Florida in both Spanish and English. Uh, would love to expand that reach into Arizona, Nevada, and Michigan. You can support that effort at faith2020.org. Um, we are choosing hope over fear. And uh, again, once election day comes and goes, we still have work to do. So make sure to stay rooted, um, stay hopeful. And to that end, uh, keep following what Tom's doing on, on Twitter, follow Next Gen, follow Hip Hop Caucus. And um, I'd love it if Brian might close us with a word of prayer. I sure will. First, God bless all of you on this panel. God bless everyone who has tuned in. And I'll send us out with words from uh, I didn't expect to receive theological inspiration from, but from Kamala Harris. Faith allows us to see what can be unburdened by what has been. So 
let's all go forward in faith. Amen. 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 Thanks, Tom. Thanks for uh, joining us. Blessings Thank all. You, everybody. Thank God you. bless you all. Onward to November. <laughs> Peace.